Well, thank you very much for staying with us. And as you can see in the background, it's all about the election uh, petition. The Supreme Court dismissed Mahama's application for review concerning those 12 interrogatories. Uh, I guess now at this point in time, we all have been checking out what interrogatories are. We're joined uh, now by Dr. Poku Edusa, a lawyer and member of the NPP communications uh, team. He'll be joining us as we discourse on uh, this all-important uh, subject. The election petition update is brought to you in association with Petrosol. Uh, clean fuel in full quantities, always a delightful experience. Also uh, by DBS Roofing, we truly are your roofing experts. And Coa Mixture, the immune booster uh, for your general well-being. Especially important in these times when we need to keep our immune systems, uh, you know, sharp to avert contracting COVID-19. Thank you very much for joining us. Let me now say a very good morning to Dr. Poku Edusei. Doc, good morning to you. Hi, good morning. And it's a pleasure to interact with you uh, this morning. Now, I'm hiding behind the mask and you may not realize it, but I've actually passed through your hands. And so uh, I'll not mention where, but if you look carefully, I'm sure you'll, you'll remember. So uh, this is a lecturer student uh, situation. Um, hopefully, uh, because when the students over time um, train themselves and learn, they tend to be uh, more perfect than, than their uh, master. Well, it's been a while, and uh, it's good to discourse with you this morning. Now, uh, let's just do this uh, with your permission. We're going to take a brief recap of uh, you know, recent events from December the 30th when that petition was filed up to this point, when indeed... Uh, you know, uh, we've got to the point where the pre-trial trial is over. So we're going to take a quick recap of what happened in court yesterday. When we come back, then we'll co uh, commence the discourse. Hearing commenced on Thursday uh, with the panel informing the lawyers in the case that uh, some of the applications that had been made were moot. Uh, the first had to do with a request that the court stays its proceedings. Uh, that particular application should have been heard on Tuesday and because it was staying proceedings pending the court dealing with the review on Thursday, uh, the court did indicate that it was moot and so uh, Mr. Chikata who had filed a particular application proceeded to withdraw it and the court struck it out as uh, withdrawn. Uh, the the second one related to a request for abridgment of time. It was a request that the Electoral Commission had made asking that the court hears at a review on a Tuesday instead of Thursday. And because it was Thursday again, the courts did note that it was also moot and lawyers for the Electoral Commission proceeded to withdraw that particular application as well. With that out of the way, the court went on a brief recess where two justices of the Supreme Court, uh, Justices Henrietta, Professor Henrietta Mensa Bonsu, as well as uh, Justice Amadou Tanko joined uh, the seven-member panel to now make a nine-member panel at which stage the legal arguments were listened to from Mr. Chikata adjusting a maneuver for the Electoral Commission and Akoto Ampao for the President Akufado's legal team. It's my submission that the arguments we have heard today by the applicant is just an emotional reaction to an unfavorable judgment quoting at day, and therefore this application should be dismissed. That's my submission. The applicant has a burden of demonstrating to the court how the refusal in this particular case was wrong. And furthermore, he has an obligation to demonstrate, one, that the error was a fundamental error, two, that that fundamental error occasioned them a gross miscarriage of justice. And Lord, we are, it's our submission that the, the applicant has failed to demonstrate these very basic conditions to grant a review. In the circumstances, my Lord, we pray that the application be dismissed as completely unmeritorious. We thought it important to have those questions dealt with in interrogatories so that we would not be burdened to have to ask them subsequently in cross-examination. In any case, your ladyship, in any case, your ladyship, if the questions are not relevant, how can they be allowed in cross-examination? If that is the position, if the questions are not relevant, if that is the position that's been taken, then they, they cannot be asked in cross-examination either. 
Are you attempting to cross a bridge you have not reached? Well, I believe you put that bridge there. <laughs> but look, with respect, this very simple way of trying to interpret Rule 69C4 would lead to gross absurdity. The court in a unanimous decision dismissed uh, first the request that was asking that it allows some additional documents to be filed uh, to bolster uh, the review arguments of Mr. Mohammed's team and also dismissed the review itself saying that it does not meet the threshold required for such a review to be granted. Proceedings have been adjourned to Friday uh, for the trial proper to commence and the various legal teams have been reacting to the directives from the court. The refusal of our applications are not fair to the petitioner in the light of the past and in the light of what is happening now. So we disagree with the rulings of the Supreme Court. Unfortunately, that's their decision. There's not much we can do. We'll be in court tomorrow. The law is not about what you want. It is about what you will get. And this business of they're talking about fair hearing and all that. In one of the authorities that their lead counsel, Mr. Tajika Kat quoted, it was stated quite clearly there that speedy hearing is synonymous to fair hearing. So I, I don't know what this fetish, it is about expedition, expedition, expedition being sacrificed for justice. In the case that he himself, Tajika Kat quoted, it was speedy hearing it's fair hearing. Well, so there you have it, a recap of events yesterday and the barbs being thrown left, right and center. Interesting ones from Marita uh, Buopong and of course uh, Chachu Chikata himself, lead counsel for uh, the Mahama legal team. We still have Dr. Poku Eduse uh, joining us over well, via Zoom, I should be saying. Now, Doc, I just want to find out from you, in the course of these last few weeks, have we, as we have you know, seen the petitioner, the, the respondents, and all the legal arguments that have been uh, made, and culminating in what we saw yesterday, what would be your overview, your take on recent happenings as we gear up for uh, the trial proper to commence? Well, thank you very much, and good morning to our listeners and viewers. Um, to start with, I think it's been a month uh, since the petition was filed and would have expected that the main trial would have started by now. But it's starting hopefully today. Um, since it was filed and then the pleadings were exchanged, all that have gone on thus far, I would say our procedure in terms of trying to get evidence extracted from the other side in terms of getting applications heard and all those, they are procedural. So it is today that the substantive aspect of the case will be gone into. And that is what Ghanaians are expecting because what we were said with uh, some time um, four years ago, uh, 2013 thereabout, um, wasn't what Ghanaians expected. We didn't want a situation whereby um, after elections, our development would then be more or less halted for us to listen to uh, legal stories, glued to our television sets. It's for that reason that under the old CI, that um, election adjudication was done. We were minded to change that regime in 2016. And interestingly, it was introduced by the then um, outgoing government in 2016. Uh, led by um, President Mahama, and of course, he worked through the, um, the Attorney General's office and, and Parliament and got CI 99 passed as the new regime for dealing with uh, election petitions. So, because of our experience, what um, the then powers that be decided was that we didn't want a, an eight month long haul kind of trial. So, let's put in place mechanisms for. Um, a speedy trial to be put in place. That was introduced by CI 99. And that is what we expect that um, this trial should be made to follow. So, I, so that at the end of the day, Ghanaians will know they are left from their right 
and then the governance issues can go on so that development is not satisfied. Now, just because you make mention of this, the timelines again, I mean, December the 30th, the filing of that petition by the NDC. Uh, looking at the dating, uh, how are the days counted, so to speak, when it comes to the petition? How much more time is left? Because I've heard people talking about whether the courts can actually satisfy what ought to be done speedily enough to give a ruling, deliver a ruling on this matter. Well, we have in the shadow of uh, the CI um, an indication of January to March. That is the extent of the framework period that the court is supposed to work with. But we have been in court for a long time, and you know that um, even in the high court where we operate under CI 47, it's, it's possible that the dates are varied by the court. So it's not compulsory. I would say mandatory that all should be done within this period. But in the CI, it says that the case should be adjudicated upon and be completed within 42 uh, days. Uh, some are interpreting it in, in different ways. But actually, in the body of the CI, it's 42 days. And if you are minded to look at how this um, regime is operating, even on weekends, processes can be filed. On holidays, processes can be filed. It tells you that uh, we are moved away from the past, in which in 2013, when the uh, then Chief Justice wanted uh, cases heard on holidays, um, Bernard Mona went to the Supreme Court and challenged it that uh, it violates the, um, the Public Holiday Act because there had not been any instrument from the executive declaring those days as holidays, uh, as, as working days. And also in the Public Holiday Act, there is also no indication that holidays we can work. And it was upheld by the Supreme Court. So when we had a new opportunity, they decided to change it and allow for uh, sometimes Saturday workings and even holiday workings as well of, of the court so that election petitions are dispatched with um, properly. And that is the regime we have. So that's what I expect that we go with and, and reduce the extent of I would say the, the antics and, and, and flowery kinds of um, dragons in, in the system. We want to hear the real story of what happened on December 7th, 2020. Now, as someone who has the law in your bosom, someone who is pretty close uh, to the court, you followed the 2012-2013 election petition, and now we have another one on our hands. Yesterday, listening to proceedings in court, you would hear reference, copious references being made to uh, that petition in 2012-2013 by Nanado Dankwe Kufuado, uh, you know, seeking some redress in court with regard to the election then. What are the lines you can draw between that petition then and this one now? I pose the question because especially on the stance of the interrogatories, a lot has come to bear about the refusal of the, the, the bench, the panel, to actually grant what the NDC has been asking. What are the substantial links or differences or um, points of convergence when it comes to these two petitions? Um, there are a number of them. Um, first, if you recall, the parties themselves in 2013 um, were a lot. The petitioners were three, um, President Akufuado, um, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, and then uh, the late Jake Obichevilamte were the petitioners. The respondents were um, then President Mahama, the Electoral Commission, and then even um, the NDC was permitted to join when they filed for joining that. Now we realize that that extent of having so many uh, parties to an election petition, which basically is based on numbers and, and, and just hardcore proof that someone thinks that figures have been padded or not. So we decided to break away from the past. So that is one difference, that in this case, the petitioner should just be the one who lost or claims that um, he, he was the first runner up and, and that person is also petition allowed. Otherwise, the NDC would have been forcing themselves to join this suit um, because they would say that they put up the candidates for the elections and they should be made to join. So 
it was taken out, uh, that opportunity was taken out completely by express legislation that the NDC facilitated in, when they were in government. So that settles it. And then the parties should, and the respondents should then be the Electoral Commission, and then the one who has been declared as, as president-elect and has been sworn in um, now. So it makes the parties maximum three. It used to be five, it could be six, thereabout. And uh, now we have only three persons uh, involved here. And the other breakaway from the past also is that we operated under CI 74 in 2013 for the elections petition. We decided that CI 74 didn't serve the interests of Ghanaians because they didn't have uh, strictures in place to, to handle flurry antics here and there. So we decided that let's enact a new constitutional instrument. And you know how constitutional instruments are made? They are, they are generated from the executive arm of government, in that case, led by the Attorney General then, Marietta, and, and then taken to Parliament. When it goes there, they sit on it, and it's actually 21 sitting days, not just any 21 days, 21 sitting days. That's why they should understand the meaning of 42 days. Because if Parliament wanted it to be 41 sitting days, they would have uh, 42 sitting days, they would have expressly stated it. So for AECI to mature, 21 sitting days before it matures, then Parliament can either decide to reject it or when and, and then pass it. So in this case, they passed it into law that we want 42 days trial for election petitions. And the breakaway is that any time you are resorting to uh, precedents of 2013 in the Akufuado and Electoral Commission case, you must be careful because we decided that some of the rulings or holdings in the case is not in the interest of Ghana. And for that reason, let's pass a new law and change it. So any time a decision of a court is given and realize that it is not in the interest of the country, parliament can intervene and change course. So the trajectory of our constitutional jurisprudence is said that um, when Riyakoto decision was given in the 1960s, making Kwame Nkrumah yeah. someone you cannot challenge, yeah. realize that 1969 constitution decided to change course. 79 constitution decided to change course. The 1992 constitution has changed course. That we want, don't want a situation whereby the executive president cannot be questioned, can just detain people under preventive detention uh, laws and then will not be permitted to be questioned. So we have decided to change course. So any time someone is arrested today, and then you are arguing the case, as let's say, Attorney General, you are, you are now arguing for the Republic, and you go inside the case of Rui Yakuto, it means that you don't understand our constitutional history very well. Because we have decided to get this in uh, Rui Yakuto case and start a new course by ensuring that Fundamental human rights are well respected and protected by the courts. That's why we have the 48 hour rule, um, the rule that you can detain someone for more than two days upon arrest. You might want to arrest somebody, give the reason why you're arresting the person. All these are strictures we have introduced because our history said, told us that that history was abominable. It wasn't in our interest. So, the same way they should understand 2013 development that we decided to break away from some of the happenings of 2013 election petition and adopted a new course in 2021 for our adjudication purposes. Now, the term interrogatories has become one that now every Mansa Kofi Abla uh, would have researched, would have wanted to find out what they are about. Looking at the NDC's continuous call for review, which culminated yesterday in that nine uh, to nothing ruling by the court. What would you say again? Uh, I, I'm trying to draw a bit of a nexus here because uh, Chachuchi Kata did make mention of the fact that in the 2012 2013 petition, there was room made for interrogatories. What are the links and differences? And again, how does this hamper the NDC's uh, you know, petition moving forward? Because they have also categorically stated that not being allowed to make these interrogatories in court is going to impact their case. What is your take? Well, I believe that uh, that cannot be the case, that when you are not permitted to ask questions under oath, so that you then 
elicit information to support the cause you are fighting in court um, through interrogatory administration, it means that you have come to the end of your matter. Not at all. Even rule um, order 22, based on which they were actually supporting their case to administer those interrogatories, there's a provision in there that says that the non-admissibility of interrogatories is no bar to uh, the party's ability or the, the plaintiff, in this case, the petitioner's ability to ask similar questions or the same questions under cross-examination. So they can ask their questions going forward under cross-examination. Because um, for lawyers, we believe that cross-examination is at large. And today, that's what we'll be exp experiencing. It is not only going to be limited to the few depositions of uh, Mr. Sudin Katia when he mounts the witness box. They will tender his testimony, uh, which is what the witness statement true, and means that that's the end of this um, statement in chief, right, evidence in chief. So after that, then he'll be handed over to the lawyers for the first respondent, which is the electoral commission, to start asking questions. And then secondly, when the electoral commission closes its um, uh, cross-examination, then uh, Mr. Sheikh handed over to Mr. Kutuampa to start cross-examining him. And we have a rule that cross-examination is at large. It tells you that you can ask so many questions. So if you're able to dig, to know the, the history of Ibi Mr. Sheikh it can be brought in that act. Uh, on these days, you said this. Um, did you believe in what you said? And if it's actually different from the reality, it means that they will then be confronted with your past um, uh, pronouncements, and that can then cast a slur on your credibility. I'll be coming back to you later, Doc, uh, to talk about this petition moving forward, now that we're moving from the pre-trial stage to the trial stage uh, proper. But also let me uh, welcome aboard Kojoga Adawudu, lawyer and member of the John Mahama legal uh, team. Uh, Mr. Adawudu, a very good morning to you, sir. Is Kojoga Dawudu on you know, via Zoom connecting with us? Well, it appears uh, we cannot hear from him. Uh, Mr. Dawudu, if you can hear me, and maybe if you've not unmuted, please unmute so we can hear you and see you. Yes, it's unmuted. Right. Thank you uh, very much for that, and thank you for joining uh, the conversation. So let's start from here. It's been a series of events, push, you know, and pull back and forth. And yesterday, uh, double blows served to your uh, team. Uh, Mr. Adawudu, if you could just stabilize. I, I don't know whether you're using your phone or some other gadget, but if you could just stabilize it and maybe uh, give us, is it landscape so we can see uh, you in full picture? That, 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 that would be great. Is it Okay. Well, I guess uh, we, we, we can make do. But if it's your phone, you could just tilt it to the other side so we have a better view of you and it's less shaky. Good, good. Thank you very much, Mr. Adawudu. So, right, technology, it, it has its own, <laughs> it has its own <laughs> ways. Thank you very much, Mr. Adawudu. Now, yesterday you were dealt a double blow in court. You had wanted to file additional documentation. That was not allowed. It was poo-pooed. Uh, there was also the bit about the interrogatories that was also thrown out by 9 to 0. What, what is the NDC's reaction to this? We've heard from Marietta Bruopong. We've heard from, uh, you know, some of your other lawyers in the team. But how do you feel about that? Um, uh, before I come to that question, uh, that, to answer that question, let me just put the whole petition in court into uh, a brief con perspective so that mm. we can, our viewers can follow us. Now, let me break it into three stages. The petition you file, what we file, we exchange documents, they answer the stage one. Let me explain stage one. We have the answer documents, we go for pre trial, we put all the documents together with any outstanding matters, with all the documents and we end up with the pre-trial. So around that time, any issue you have, 
you have you can raise it that's why the interrogatories were raised admit facts were raised issues were raised so that brings end to the stage one the first stage the second stage is that the trial where the witnesses mount the box they are cross examined whilst they are cross examined and the end of the cross examination for all the parties they have testified that is the end of stage two then they will ask the court will ask instead of coming to court to address them they will ask you to file your case or a submission that you have made reduce it and put it on paper and you bring it when you finish with that now the court comes and gives a judgment so you realize that at stage one we were looking at the rules asking for interrogatories asking for facts to be admitted and at the end of the day what ends it with the pre-trial is that what you are going to say in the box reduce it with all your document to substantiate reduce it on paper and in our balance we say witness statement so that has been done now what happened yesterday was that we have asked self interrogators interrogatory simply means that we want information more information or details or further and better particulars as to a fact that has been made now the court says that no it will not agree because it is not relevant two one of the rules that is order 22 will not be applicable in this matter because they have been given timelines and when there is timeline they would dispense with that rule which we said that that's why we have gone on review and we said that one fundamentally you cannot say you will not apply that law because it forms part of our law to if you are saying it's not relevant that we can ask those questions how can we now say that it will be relevant when we ask in that's a thing that if it is fundamental that you give us you exercise discretion mm. when you have been given the power to exercise discretion in everything you are guided by article 296 so that's why we went on the review and the review you saw the exposition of the law whether right or wrong we have made that exposition to the court as to what the rules and the law says but unfortunately the court disagrees with us our position and the court has spoken now as lawyers we have been trained it doesn't move us we are not perturbed it doesn't have much effect on the substantive case mm. that these are the things we are asking so we will now employ this as it has been done already in the witness statement some parts of the questions that other has been factored into it and in cross-examination we will also find a strategy by which we will go so if you go to court and the court disagree with you it is uh, on the lighter note to say it was more like a comic relief to say it is 9-0. Okay, Mr. Adawu, we I, just, I just want to pose this question and interject briefly. Are you suggesting then that you're going to find ways of circumventing what the court has done? Because it has stated its reasons, even drawing uh, you know, a nexus, if you like, between what it did in 2013 and what it's doing now and why what happened in 2013 may not necessarily reflect what, the, what position the court will take when it comes to interrogatories. So are you suggesting that when the trial proper starts, your team is going to find ways of circumventing this review that was thrown out by the court so that you still have your way? Is that what you're saying? No, no. I think the court even made that indication clearly that the fact that interrogatories has not been accepted, has been dismissed, hmm. doesn't mean that in cross-examination you cannot ask those questions. Exactly. And my learned friend, um, Mr. Edu Seipoku, Dr. Edu Seipoku, sorry, has exactly even said that, say. that law has even said that it will not be a bar if the court dispenses with the interrogation, the information you want, 
you can still ask, uh, ask in cross-examination. It is for the court or the opponent to say this question is not relevant or not, take an objection. So it gives an indication that some of the questions that we may be asking, they may be objections which have to be ruled, which have to be sustained. That is what we anticipate. So cross-examination is to test your credibility, is to get the facts, and you turn the facts around, whether the person is lying on oath or not. That's the purpose of cross-examination, to bring out the facts and bring out the truth. So you are assisting the court. So the questions that we have at cross-examination, we cannot be limited. And we cannot be limited and say, this question you cannot ask. The only thing maybe they can say is that the question will not be relevant, or the question is unfair to the witness, or the question is a legal question that the witness is being asked. So if you have any question, it's wide. You are testing the person's competence. You are testing the person's training. You are testing the person's personal knowledge of the matters, of what he has seen, what has happened. It is not what you heard. It is what you have seen, what happened, that is going to be tested on. So cross-examination gives you a wide latitude by which you can ask questions. The only thing is that you don't ask questions that would be unfair, questions that would be like you're harassing the person, the question that would be a legal question, that the person is not a lawyer and the person cannot um, answer that question properly. Okay. Uh, b before I cross over back to uh, Dr. Poku Eduse, very briefly. Now, these interrogatories, I put the question to Dr. Eduse earlier, and uh, you know he shared his thoughts on them. Now that th this opportunity to pose those 12 interrogatories has been denied, does that affect you know, your position in any way? Because you have been pushing for this, you have gone for the review and all of that. Does it affect your position? No, 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 not, not at all. You know, interrogatories, let me put it in a... Uh, and uh, just give you a classical example so that we we'll see if we can put it in perspective. I have a contract with you. The contract is worth 200 CDs. You agree that we have a contract. Now pay me, you said you will not pay. So I have taken you to court. Now the contract we are saying is 200. In your answer or defense, you say that yes, we have a contract, but I don't owe you 200 CDs. So you owe me, then I now come with interrogators and I ask question. How much was the total sum of the contract? You will answer 200 CDs. How much did you pay out of this? You say, I paid 100 CDs. How much is outstanding? You say, it's 100 CDs. What is the mode that you paid, cash or check? You said, I paid through check. Which bank, this, this. Now, we have narrowed down the issue to only handle this which is outstanding, right? That's the purpose of interrogatory. So you narrow it down. You say you paid 100 cities already. If it is true, that means that we are not even going to talk about 200 cities now. It will be only 100 cities which is outstanding that we would come and say, yes, the issue has been narrowed down to 100 cities. So it has been narrowed down and we won't waste time going into 200 cities. So the purpose that we were doing was to narrow down some of the facts, narrow down the issues. But if the court disagrees with us on that, it tells you that now we need to go into the matter to the extent that we have to prove that the contract sum was 200 and you haven't paid anything. So that was the purpose. So the fact that the interrogatories has not been admitted or allowed, granted, it does not affect our case in any way. Right. Already we have also put up that some facts that they should admit. Right. Now, if, if you admit those facts, it will be used as part of the process in cross-examination. If you don't admit those facts or you do not answer the facts, it will also be, the court will be reminded that facts we ask that you should admit some facts, and you did not do it. And since you did not do it, these are the consequences. So we were all in all this, the interrogatories and the rest, was to narrow down the issues, and we zero in into two major things. How did you go by compiling the results where you had mathematical error, which they had admitted already, and 
how you activity in declaration violated or was an infraction on Article 63, uh, 64, right? There is 63, 64, we are talking about that. So these are all that we were aiming at. And I think, by and large, the court also said, so in our cross-examination, I'm sure we will have our strategy to right. be able to achieve uh, the purpose why we are in court. Thank you for making that clear. Now, Dr. Pukwe do say, there's also been that case of, you know, filing supplementary, uh, you know, statements of... Uh, case and of course uh, the NDC was dealt an another blow in that respect, uh, regardless of you know citing the precedents of the courts, that same court in uh, the past. W what is your understanding of of the decision of the court when it comes to disallowing the NDC to proceed with its additional statements of case? All right, thank you, and uh, I want to say good morning to my colleague uh, Adauda. You know, he has been eruditing, uh, giving information about what interrogatories are supposed to do. So before I go to your question, let me also make it clear that the, ideal, uh, the idealism of uh, interrogatories in trying to make sure that issues are brought within their right perspective and, and trial is facilitated is sometimes not uh, what lawyers administer it to do. So the, the construction of the mind cannot be seen in the face. Sometimes when lawyers are going to court, it may be that they are even handicapped in terms of information uh, that they, they have. They don't have any evidence. So they then embark on what you call a fishing expedition. So it's that fine line of fishing and interrogatories, that's why the court is supposed to see through and see whether you came prepared with evidence before coming to court or you were just coming to fish. And fishing is actually frowned upon by, by the court. Well, well those, are, those are some very interesting comments you make. A fishing expedition, I mean, it would basically suggest that uh, the NDC's legal team is going out on a limb, that they really don't have certain bases upon which they can ride on this case. In, for which reason, for which, for which reason, for, for which reason they, they, they were relying on these interrogatories. Is, is, that, is that your thinking? That is, that is actually the case. They wanted to fish. <laughs> no, no, no. Then the fish they don't understand our strategy. <laughs> you know, it's in their head. It's, uh, it's like the mind construction cannot be seen in the face. Uh, when they are coming in that kind of way, uh, that's why they, after losing, decided that, no, it wasn't enough. Let's go for review. And in the review, I'm now transitioning to the question you asked. How come in the past supplementary um, statement of case or supplementary additional grounds are permitted to be filed. Mm -hmm. And in this case, uh, they were not successful. Um, they were not successful for simple reason. You know, there is, uh, among the jurisdictions of the Supreme Court, it's what you call the review jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. It's a very special jurisdiction, and it is only the Supreme Court of Ghana that has that power. No court whatsoever has gotten review jurisdiction powers. Um, the High Court in Order 42, they have something to call review, but that has even been ruled on. It's actually supposed to be used to correct minor, minor errors in, in judgment. But typical special review jurisdiction is only vested in the Supreme Court. And it is exercised on very rare basis. And that's why Rule uh, 54 of the, of the uh, Supreme Court rules um, tell us that there should be two conditions. You must meet at least one of them. There should be exceptional circumstances that will result in miscarriage of justice before your review application can be made to stand. And one of such is that maybe there is a law that the court didn't even know. Or th that kind of exceptional circumstance must be there. The second one is that there should be evidence or material information that was not available by your reasonable exercise of diligence um, at the time the decision was given. So you have now gotten the information. So new material facts that you couldn't have known. But even those material facts, if you could have known and you were derelict in the discharge of your duty, you cannot meet the test of, of uh, Rule 54 of the uh, Supreme Court rules. So when they filed for review, they then applied to add onto the grounds of the review. That's number one. And then also, when the grounds is added, a new ground, I don't know which ground it was, um, then they were going to file supplementary, um, that's a legal argument, that's what they call a statement of case. 
uh, in the Supreme Court. So they were going to file supplementary statements of case to buttress um, the review. When they went, the court first checked from them under which rule they were coming with that kind of application. And they said that they were moving on the basis of the inherent jurisdiction of the court. It means that expressly there is no provision that allows for you to for, uh, file additional um, ground for legal, um, review when you have already filed your statement of case and then the review application has been filed. So they were then citing authorities to support that, oh, in this case, uh, review, uh, I mean, in this case, supplementary uh, were permitted for additional ground to be filed. Additional statement of case were also filed. But the court was also very smart. They actually saw the authorities, because they have delivered this judgment, mm. uh, they have read wide, and when the authorities came, they knew that the authorities that were being cited all along by um, the leading council, the lead council for the petitioners, were authorities in respect of appeals to the Supreme Court. And then the court said, okay, let's look at um, appeal rules. When you look at the rules on appeal, the, there's a whole section dealing with appeal from court of appeal to the Supreme Court. There are provisions that permit you to file additional ground of appeal. But if you look at review section, there's nothing like that there. So the court said, all these authorities that we have permitted others to file additional ground were in respect of appeals. And the powers of the Supreme Court, we are talking of review powers, appellate powers, original jurisdiction, and, and, and uh, I think yeah, there are a few of them, and, and what you call uh, judicial review powers as well. So if you can get um, additional grounds filed any time you are appealing against a decision of the High Court, it doesn't mean that you can get additional ground filed any time you are appealing, you are applying for review of our decision. Okay. That's where the difference is. Do the reason so, that we lost. So, so, so in a nutshell, in a nutshell, you are in complete agreement with the ruling of the Supreme Court on this matter. You feel uh, the entire basis for a review and subsequent, you know, uh, petitions basically did not hold any water. So you are in agreement when it comes okay. to this bit. I agree with them. Okay. That there were no material facts that they had. Also, there were no exceptional circumstances that mm. occasioned a miscarriage of justice. All right. Because Let here is the case that the questions, the 12 questions you are talking about, um, you could ask them in cross-examination, so what have you been denied? Nothing. So there's no miscarriage of justice. All right. You, are uh, right do, 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 do. you can just put your case across without the review um, uh, uh, jurisdiction being met. And they couldn't meet it. And it's a very high threshold mm. because judges are not flip-flops, right? You don't expect them to hold a rule today, seven of them. And then all the seven are sitting, two are added, in the case of Professor Mensa Bosu and then uh, Justice Tanku. Mm -hmm. They are not flip-flops. <laughs> they went and spread and then the next day, you know, uh, okay, it means that all of us, or at least four out of the seven, must come and join the new number, or three, join the new number, before you can get uh, five, four. It doesn't work that way. All Judges right. are not flip-flops. Mr. Dawudu, so, I, I can see from your... The, the, you cannot succeed right. on review. Mr. Dawood, I can see from the expression on your face that you would like to quickly you know, react to this. And I'd like to find out from you as well. Now, I listened to Frank Davies yesterday, and he made mention of the fact that it appears your team is not ready. I mean, from this push, when it comes to the interrogatories, he's been asking yourself, himself whether you know, your star team, so to speak, is actually ready to deal with the facts. And that you are using the law, it's not a matter of, you know, so to speak, running your mouth, quoting, citing case upon case. Is your team ready, to, as we commence with the trial proper today? Is your team ready? Um, uh, just to, yes, uh, let me say in very affirmative and very positive manner that our team has been ready from day one. Our team, you see, the only problem they are having with us is that they don't understand our strategy. Is the same what what is your strategy? strategy. Do, do share with us. Hello? What is this strategy? No, no. That, I, I, I can share my, our strategy with you on air. But listen, you see, we use the rules. We use the rules to apply to the court. They have never been on any occasion where the court said that what we have filed 
all the way we approach the court, it is not supported by any rule. Every rule that we use, we go to court, it tells you that we sit, we research, we see the rules. I've always been saying that if you have been given a right to exercise and you decide not to exercise it and somebody is exercising those rights by using the rules, you don't come and say that we are only, they are not ready. It is because you don't understand the way we are coming. Well, maybe you would have now, to help us understand because if, if we are taking what happened yesterday, for example, into context, and you are losing by nine against and none for the petition for review that you put forward. Yes, you may be applying the law, but how how potent is what what you are putting forward? That's the question, isn't it? Listen, you see, you are trained as a lawyer. You come, the judges disagree with you on your exposition of the law. Mm your understanding of the law. And we have espoused a position. And they are saying that simply they said that what we are saying for the review, let me just explain the reason for the benefit of our listeners. It, it has to be a it's bit brief, like, but please go ahead. It's brief. It's just brief. It's just like you go to the chief palace. Maybe the paramount chief, or let me say the uh, Omai Hine has decided the matter, or vice versa, the paramount chief has decided the matter. And you say, you are saying that, I think that the decision you have made, it is, it is not right. So take a second look at it. So now the paramount chief will invite other chiefs, his divisional chiefs or others, in addition to six. That's why we saw it was seven is moved to nine. So that you look at your own decision and say that, yes, if I look at it, this law inadvertently, I did not look at it. Yes, when we're exercising our discretionary power, as the court said that interrogatory is discretionary power, maybe I did not exercise it well in accordance with this. So those are the things that we did, that we have asked for. Okay. Now, to go back to the issue of whether we were prepared or not. You know, we have been preparing every day. Those interrogatories that I have said, yes, although may have been factored into the substantive case, there's another way that has been suggested to us, even by the court, that cross-examination. We have been ready from day one, and we are going to use the law. We've been trained as lawyers that even when you make, espouse your position, the position of the law, and the judge disagree with you. That's why we have the appellate system that you go to three judges after high court. From right. there, you go to fight in the Supreme Court. Mm. Now, it is only in Supreme Court that that is the finality of it. When they speak with the review jurisdiction, there is a public policy under it that says that litigation at the point must stop. So when they speak, that is they bring finality to that issue. And as we've seen, they brought finality to the issue of interrogatories. Okay. So we have filed requests to admit, and that will form part of our substantive case. And let me assure everybody that if we knew we did not have a case, we wouldn't have even gone to court. And there are two things that our petition, the case says that you have violated the Constitution, and by declaring that the way you went about it, by the mathematical errors, if you put all the presidential candidates, their figures together, you will not get none of the candidates who have gotten 50 plus one or 50 and above of the vote. That is our case we okay. put there. Point, point well made. Now, we'll be wrapping up on what the expectations are, especially as today. Normally, there wouldn't have been a sitting, but Friday, we're going to have a sitting as we sort of fast track uh, this matter, so to speak, so we can meet the deadlines. We'll be getting into that. But, uh, Mr. Adawudu, my final bit before we get into that, and after that, I'll cross over to Dr. Poku Eduse. Looking at how, you know, the sort of trade of comments and all of that between your end, your legal team, and the bench. I mean, yesterday, for example, Marietta Brew, upon some of the comments that were made, Chachu and Koch talking about the bridges that are being, you know, placed in the way of progressing with this uh, court petition. And it may be even casting my mind back a bit about this, the, the rebuke, so to speak, that uh, Dr. Aine uh, got. 
Don't you feel your end is antagonizing the bench, the justices of the court, and that while they are supposed to be neutral, you could be setting, you know, laying the ground for a negative outcome? Don't you feel that? No, no, no. Um, I'll take it in two perspectives, two contexts. Those two have to be brief. There is one communication that is... Yeah, yeah, there's one communication is when court and the judges there, they know, let me tell you, when you go, they want to test to see whether what you are espousing, you know the law or you don't know. You see, when you explain to a point, when one of the justices asks about, uh, don't mention the name of the electoral commission and the chairperson, and you see, we went on and say, the law says you are the returning officer. It can only be one returning officer. So the fact that you are being heckled does not mean that you cannot espouse the law in court. Mm. We are trained that even in a hostile environment, you make your case and put your law before. Mm. Two, when it comes to communication out of court, which I think that the, our opponents, you have said, yes, there have been negatives as to what we communicate because the public also learns from what we say and the communication. But where we have seen also that there is an agenda to tear down the image or bring down the image of people or attack people's personality by the other side, where you see every day they refer to the lead council, it's not about literature, it's not about prose, it's not about poetry, it's not English, and personalities are mentioned. It is the petition who has brought this case that you see that it is a deliberate agenda just to end, bring his image down or discredit him and say that he doesn't know his law, he's been overhyped, and cascade down to members of the legal team. Mm. That is why when it happens like that, we would also be forced to reply in equal measure. But I think at the point where we are as lawyers and officers of the court, we must be decorous. We must be civil in our communication, no matter how we have been provoked by the other side. So I think, yes, there have been some negatives in the communication after court. And I think that these are senior members of the bar, and we need to look at it again and make sure, yes, petition will come and pass. We are friends. We don't have to make comments okay. that enjoy the I, I, feelings of each other. I'll have us hold it there. I was talking about the bench as well and communications. But uh, Dr. Fokwe Duse, uh, as we proceed uh, with this matter, the trial uh, commencing, what do you forecast? What do you foresee? All the facts that we've seen thus far, the reviews, the petitions, the statements of case, and now culminating in this, what are you looking forward to? Well, for the second respondent, uh, my main focus will be for the petitioner to establish with concrete evidence that uh, votes were padded, so they'll be queried on it. And if it was, where is it reflected on the pink sheet? Um, no, earlier when they were coming, they indicated that 32 polling stations they had issues with. And even that when you put the numbers together, they were about 6,000. We got their witness statement, and now the number has reduced from 32 to 26. So, in a sense, their complaint is about 4,000 police, uh, 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 4,000 and something numbers, votes, not even police stations. So, 26 police stations translated into 4,000 votes plus. Um, we are talking of I, I, I have who seen some saying 6,000 plus votes, but 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 you go ahead. Plus votes. So. That 4,000 will not be able to be reduced the 500,000 plus, uh, the plus on it, for it to be substantial. The essence of the court is, is that they are supposed to do substantial justice. So if there's a slip, and then it forms the basis of your entire action, 35 paragraphs of the entire deposition in the petition is about the slip on December 9th. So you then have to, we will be assessing whether that goes to the substance of the elections of 2020, December 7th. If it doesn't, it means that nothing was broken and, and therefore we wouldn't need a fix. 
Well, uh, Mr. Daudu, maybe uh, your brief expectations in some 30 seconds, one minute. What are your expectations moving forward from th your team and, uh, you know, this strategy you've been speaking of? Yeah, um, I, I think that we have uh, successfully put our petition there um, in the court. And uh, Mr. Asidun Ketia, the general in politics, the only general in politics in Ghana who mounts the box. Mm. And I know he has personal knowledge of the issues, the electoral matters, because uh, he's been round, he's gone round, he's been at IPAC and what, what happens and what happened in this election. He, he did say him on the other side in 2013. Us. You're bringing him back. Exactly, because it will tell you that when somebody does he something, he's promoted or you reinforce him. Then you, you tell him that, yeah, he's done well. And I, I think everybody would say that, who agree with me, that when he was in the box 2013, he espoused how the processes and everything is that good. So, so I think that I expect him to make a good delivery and would expand sheet and explain um, our position with the petition and how things are done, the electoral law, what has to be done. And I think that we will have a very good day. And also to educate, whilst he says it, it will educate us in the electoral laws and the processes when it comes to election. Give me a yes or no answer. This is the very final bit. Is the NDC winning this petition? Are you, are you going to achieve the ends that you've put forward? Are you going to achieve those ends? Yes or no? Just give me a yes or no answer. Yes, yes. We, we will achieve our objectives. Right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Kujuga Dawudu is a lawyer, member of the legal team for John Dramani Mahama as they put forward this election 2020 petition. Of course, we also have uh, the man I've made uh, clearly known as a former lecturer of mine when it comes to law, Dr. Poku Eduse. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you. After several years of intensive research, DBS Industries Limited brings you roofing sheets to help complete your dream house in style. Experience the amazing touch of ColorLink Plus roofing sheets in 26 years, which means ColorLink Plus roofing sheets always stays clean and beautiful for you. And there's more. We're giving you a whopping 20-year warranty against fading and peeling. Visit DBS Industries Limited in Accra on the Spintex Road in the DBS building near the Papaya restaurant. You want to call? Of course you should. Call them on 0240-844-444, 0240-844-444, or 0543-286-637. Or visit any of their factories in Kumasi, Tamale, and Takrade. DBS Industries Limited, we truly are your roofing experts. Now, Petrosol, it's always there for you. Due to hard times, we've become value hunters. But are we hunting for value the right way? Remember... Your engine is more valuable than just cheap fuel. Be smart. Hunt for holistic value. Holistic value is when you have quality fuel at the right quantity and at a fair price. That's fair, right? At Petrosol, we serve clean fuel in full quantities at a fair price, and that is holistic value. So come to us, Petrosol, clean fuel in full quantities. Well, time now for us to move on to our next segment, and when we return... Parliament has uh, thrown out Mahama Yariga's motion for government to absorb the fees of tertiary students. It went down to a vote. Now, what exactly does this mean? What are the details? All that when we return. Do stay.